All right, everybody, this is Ross. Um, today's video, we're going to give you guys a tour of the backyard, and I don't want to just focus on the figs. Uh, we're going to give you guys a view into different various points of interest. We're here on the patio because actually we just ripened uh, a couple Morris Nigra mulberries. That was the first for me in years. So we did a separate video on that, and I hope you guys will check that out. But I also want to show you guys the pomegranates here while we're on the patio. We're going to look at the jujubes, uh, the persimmons we're going to look at, different berry plants that are fruiting around the yard. Things like the raspberries, the blueberries, the strawberries, the currants, um, the honeyberries, etc., etc. And then also I want to show you guys the garden. That's really the big winner here, I think, this year is how well the garden's doing. Um, because now we're in, you know, close, we're getting closer to the summer solstice. I would say here in the Philadelphia area around June 1st, you could pretty much just make an argument that we're seeing weather that is a lot like the summer. So even though we're not at the summer solstice yet, the longest day of the year, which is when I like to do these videos is to do them at the summer solstice so I can go back and view what the yard looked like uh, every summer. Um, I do want to do this video now because everything is just growing like crazy. Everything looks like a jungle. Everything looks so different than our last tour that we did, which was in the spring. Um, so I think it's pretty cool. And I want to show you guys a little bit of updates on different things. So um, yeah, hold tight. Let's show you guys around the yard. Um, I do want to update you guys quickly on the potted figs here. These are my young trees and they are just getting massive. Some of them are almost at my waist. And uh, these are extremely young. Like I rooted these three to six months ago. Um, some I rejuvenation pruned um, this past, this spring, and they were rooted the past season. So it's amazing how quickly everything is growing and how well the figs do um, when rejuvenation pruned and even started from cutting and when they're fed so well. Here I have my citrus trees, and we haven't talked about these all that much. I did a video talking about some care that I recommend um, for when you bring them into your house during the winter time, because I can't leave them out here. It just gets too cold. Some of them obviously get affected by pests. We have uh, spider mites and scale are really the two big ones. We have some flowers here, thankfully. Um, I was seeing some more flowers on this guy here. This is my Australian finger lime. This is the one I'm the most excited about, as well as the Fukushu kumquat over here. They're getting some good size to them, these plants. Um, a few of them did take a little bit of sunburn when I moved them outside. You can see that there. Um, and also they were really heavily infected with some pests. This one had horrible scale, and therefore there's some dead branches and a lot of wood actually I cut out but some ladybugs came in here and just decimated the scale and now this tree is putting out all this nice really pretty new growth which is really good to see I wish it would flower again because it did have some flowers on it when it had the scale and then because of the scale it just never set fruit and it's really tough I think taking care of these guys because it's such a long winter that they're inside for and if you can get them through that winter time looking pretty good they're going to be so much happier in the spring and you'll actually get the results that you want but it it really does depend on that to be honest with you um, let's look at the garden right now because it's just going insane these are my potatoes that we planted we actually put down some a layer of compost first, put the potatoes in the compost, then put down a really thick layer of straw. They grew right through the straw. Then I put down a second layer of straw, and uh, right now they're actually, so that works as a form of hilling, and therefore they are doing so well. Hopefully I'll have a really huge crop of potatoes because some of these look really quite good. I am seeing some flowers now, which is a sign that they're getting ready for harvest unfortunately or that's like the beginning um, of when some potatoes are forming it depends on the variety but overall I think they look great and I imagine my harvest will probably be sometime around in July maybe mid to late 
July, early August. What has really been the big surprise here and what I've overjoyed to see is the corn. And the corn is getting up there in height, guys. It seems to be doing really well. Admittedly, I have been feeding the corn. I've been watering the corn. Normally in the garden, I don't do any feeding and I don't do any watering. In the beginning, when we plant our plants and plant our seeds, we do some bed prep, right? Always do that bed prep. We add micronutrients. We add a little bit of organic fertilizer. We did that for the corn, but um, I've also been coming in here with some synthetic fertilizer and also additional water really to see if we can get this corn to work because I've been failing for years. And uh, believe it or not, we only planted this corn from seed a month ago. Isn't that insane how big these plants look? And we're, I think, really gearing up for a big year with the corn. I like the spacing. I like the setup. We should have good pollination with the rows that we have. In between the rows, we have squash. This is some patty pan squash. And the patty pan squash, I mean, it's just, it's just massive, isn't it, guys? Um, and then we also have over here, these are all plants that we started indoors, by the way. We have some melons. We have some Sharon Tay type, believe it or not. That should do quite well. I don't like this leaf. Maybe we should take it off. But I'm going to be continually on the prowl for cucumber beetle. I really want to make sure that these plants are not getting disease. I may cover them with insect netting. We have some melons down there. We have uh, two types of melons. The Blacktail Mountain, which is good for shorter season climates. And we also have the Orange Glow from uh, Baker Creek. So we'll see how those guys do. I'm really excited. Now, what is happening now that is becoming the summer solstice is that our flowering plants, our summer flowers are coming in. And this is bee balm. And I'll tell you, bee balm does in fact live up to his name. <laughs> it attracts so many bees that these uh, plants here, these flowers are gonna be covered in bees for a good amount of time, um, I've been seeing, because of all these flowers, a really big change in the ecosystem here in my yard uh, in terms of bugs. This here is, I don't remember the name of this flower, but um, this one also I think does a pretty decent job, but nowhere near the quality of these smaller flowers you'll see. Each of these little flowers, depending on what it is, really uh, attracts beneficial insects and that's what you kind of want to look for I find in more orchard management systems is that we want to plant things that have those smaller flowers like if you can think about um, some alliums have really small flowers like that I know the bee bomb does um, golden rods another good one um, yeah just you know, try to figure out, guys, what is putting out these really... Oh, fennel is really great as well. Fennel I find to be fantastic. And I just have volunteer fennel coming up all over the place. And Honestly, it's shading out some of these figs. So I need to probably dig out some of this and put it somewhere else. And it's just a little bit of a mess with how this is all going. But um, I'd rather have these fennel plants than not. Um, and I have another bee bomb right there. So pretty soon the bees are going to be real happy now that it's the summer. Um, although in the spring, they're also equally as happy, I find, for different reasons and different plants. Here's my tomatoes. We've been trellising them up vertically as we do every year, taking out the suckers. You can see some gray, uh, green stretch tie down there. And we're growing them up against these poles. We have different varieties that I absolutely love, like the pink brandy wine. We have the orange banana tomato I use for paste. You really can't beat those, uh, I find. And then also I have some different varieties like the black cherry. And we're trying some different ones in here to see how they do. And uh, But the majority of this year really stuck with the standards, the pink brandy wine. Uh, also, I really like green zebra. We're growing that one as well. And they've got flowers on them. So it's not like uh, these guys are really all that far away. Believe it or not. I planted all these tomato plants from seed, direct seeded them. Here's a sucker, by the way. You can see that where it comes out from this leaf stem, attaches to the main stem. In between that, in that crotch right there, 
is a sucker. We just break those off so that we can maintain them as a single stemmed tomato plant. But um, yeah, direct seeded, as I said, like around May 1st. And I had them, you can see the remnants of the low tunnels here with the plastic over top. That kind of really got them going um, earlier in the spring. Even these eggplants were direct seeded. And I gave them a little bit of a, uh, a silica spray, the Dynagrow Protect. Same thing with these, um, t uh, these peppers. And I'm telling you, the difference after spraying that was insane. Um, even when transplanting this pepper here to this location and this really small guy, spraying them with that Dynagrow Protect, whew, oh my goodness, I saw some incredible results. See these little holes? This is all from the flea beetle creates these little holes and really damages these small seedlings. And it makes it more difficult for small seedlings that you direct seed into the ground for them to establish themselves. I know for a fact that there's probably something that's a bigger deal here on the eggplants, considering how big the, uh, the holes are. Um, there's a beetle I know that attacks these, these eggplants. So um, after I sprayed that, that Dynagrow Protect, I did two applications. It's been like a night and day difference here, guys. I'm telling you, I'm doing that stuff pretty much for life. I really am a true believer in silica, and that's really what the what the product does, is it gives these trees and these plants some silica. Here is my Salavatsky pomegranate, and this thing survived the winter, no damage. Um, I did break off some of the buds dealing with the low tunnels have yet to see any flowers but the tree is a bit young considering how much damage it took the first year I planted it but this year was a bit mild um, however I do expect um, no doubt to see some good results with that tree in the future um, in terms of hardiness now here's my pomegranates that we have in pots and also I want to show you the the jujubes here um, these guys are just going insane. I mean, look how much growth is on the pomegranates. They look so green, so lush. They're really beautiful plants, I find, and they're flowering. This is a new variety for me. This is supposed to be the tastiest pomegranate, according to uh, a friend of mine. And uh, I don't really know how to pronounce this, so I'm going to spare the pronunciation, but it's... I guess I will say it because everybody's going to be asking me, but it's called the Mayak Gosomeni Rizovi Pomegranate. Holy crap. Behind it, in addition to what's flowering right now so early, is the Purple Heart Pomegranate. And you can see the flowers down there um, that really do look beautiful. And there's quite a few of them on the Purple Heart. So good to see that those two are actually quite early, this one here and that one. Additionally, you can really be impressed. Look at that variety. This thing's covered, guys, covered in pomegranates or in, uh, in flowers. This is a variety called Sumbar. It is the earliest soft-seeded palm. It's also quite hardy. So for a lot of people, that may be a really great palm to grow in shorter seasons in colder climates. Uh, a bunch of these other pomegranates, by the way, are fruiting or are flowering as well, but it's just really the beginning stages. And I could probably go around and show you some others, but I know there's a couple on this side that are doing quite well. The, uh, the jujubes are right next to them. I planted two in the ground, by the way, we can look at uh, at a later video, but uh, you can see the flowers are opening. And what I'm finding along these flowers is that I do believe there is a pollination issue between the jujubes and the pomegranates. They just have some weird pollination. They have really have some weird pollinators. And I find that the ants, actually you can see an ant crawling on that branch. I do find that the ants are helping. The parasitic wasps, you can see actually an ant right there who is pollinating that particular flower. Um, so the ants work, the flies work. I've seen flies on them. I've seen very small black parasitic wasps. I've also seen a big, uh, a big, it's a, called a great black wasp is actually the name of it. <laughs> I think it's called great or, yeah, I think it's called great 
black wasp. And that was on here yesterday, pollinating these jujubes. And I find that, uh, at least that's my theory, as to why some of these pomegranates are being, or the uh, jujubes, I should say, are getting good fruit set versus others that are not. And um, yeah, that to me is like at least the only thought process that I can come up with. Other people say it's the sun. Other people claim it's the heat. And that just jujubes are not really all that reliable in, uh, in a climate like mine. But so far, I've had pretty good success with uh, specific varieties, having them on the patio, in the pots. Maybe they're alternate bearing. That's another option here. I don't know. Let's see if we have any strawberries that are ripe. This one's ripe. This is my Rucker Scarlet. It's a really good strawberry. Get some more back in there. I'm hungry. Let's get some, let's get some strawberries here, guys. Maybe we can get some other food in here. This is my cool loving crop bed here, guys. And I've also planted some crops in here because we took out our shallots, we took out our garlic, and I planted in cucumbers. Normally, I said, never doing the cucumbers again. Mainly because of the cucumber beetle and how that affects the squash, the squash how that affects the squash and the melons because the cucumber beetle is attracted really to the cucumbers first and then it comes over to the rest of these plants and decimates them with the fusarium wilt so for me i said all right no no cucumbers but i'm going to cover this bed with um, some insect netting i'm going to cover as much as i can with some insect netting and uh, that's going to be my solution here. I got some sugar snap peas that are finishing up super productive this year. They're, they're incredible. I'm telling you. They're so, so good. It's nuts. It really is nuts. They're so sweet. Almost as sweet as that strawberry. I swear to God. Um, the cool oven crop bed ain't doing too bad. We've got carrots in the front row here, and those are mochum. They're going to come up very soon. Some of them I've already been able to harvest. They're getting to that size that you want. We now have mizuna coming up in here. I got some Swiss chard. I have my new crop here of squash, of the patty pan. More melons that we planted to replace all this. We have beets in this row. Some more mochum carrots. We've got a row of radishes, I think, and another row of radishes. Um, well, no, we already did a harvest of radish. But this is a second harvest of the French breakfast radish. It just crops so quickly. Here they are. Wow, look at these. Look at the size of these things. I really didn't even plant these that long ago. I'm shocked. The slugs got some of my earlier ones, but these are just amazing. Look how beautiful these are, too. Oh my God. Look at these guys. That's a wonderful sight here. These are really good, by the way, these French breakfast radishes. Just a huge recommendation for these. You can pretty much grow these all year as well. There's not really a certain time uh, because they just put up with the heat. You may have less germination in the summer, but I find here, at least, they just do well all year. You can plant them every two weeks and have nonstop radishes. They're insanely good. You can't eat them fresh as I'm eating them because they're that good. What also is here is something just like this radish. I mean, I don't know if I like them more or less, but it's the Hakurai turnip. Let me see if I can find one that's pretty, got some size to it. Here we go. Here's a decent one. I mean, you can obviously get them 
much bigger size than this and you would probably normally wait because they call them snow apples right so if they're snow apples you would think they're probably the size of an apple um, we got some beans back here by the way before I show you guys the beans are forming right now and I'll take one off just to show you but I've got like four types of beans here we've also got the soybean for edamame we have some Brussels sprouts coming up in the beans believe it or not once these sugar snap peas finish I'm gonna be planting um, some broccoli and this is gonna be the fall broccoli of the variety solstice we're also going to put in some red carrots, the Kyoto red carrot. Because um, we have some carrots in here, but the Kyoto red is supposed to be for, um, for a winter harvest or a harvest in the spring of the following season. So that's what we're doing. We have some onions in here that honestly don't look too great, but they're coming together. Worst case scenario, I use them for green onion. But they should hopefully start bulbing up here because it's getting a little late at this point. The um, the nasturtiums, by the way, um, we have in here. So there's all kinds of food, all kinds of stuff. I will say that the spring crops really weren't all that great this year. Not too much of a success on everything. I had a ton of arugula. Here's the string bean here. And this is a kalima bean. This is the variety kalima. This is my favorite. But I'm trialing others to see if I like some others more. It's really good. It's so tender. You don't have to cook it. Here's the Hakurai turnip. Really quite sweet. Mild. By the way, these turnips or these radishes are also quite mild. So it's not like, you know, I'm really getting a ton of spice. You will get some spicier radishes in the summer. But... So far, I think the Hakurai's, you can grow them all summer also. And they're just more mild. They're just sweeter that way. Where, you know, if I look at the uh, radish here, let's try the other one. It's definitely spicier. Wow, that one was pretty good. But there's still hints of that in the aftertaste. You get that spice. And here is the Swiss chard, which a lot of you guys probably cook. Personally, I eat this stuff raw. It's that good. Um, I would like to cook some. I would like to juice some. I also planted a number of different Swiss chards here. So I wonder if this is the perpetual spinach or if this is the Swiss chard that I normally grow. Um, but uh, to me, it tastes like shrimp. It's just so good and tender. You don't have to harvest it when they're huge. You can make a salad out of the really smaller leaves, the more tender leaves. I have Swiss chard in the back that's going to seed, and that stuff back there, um, it's going to put seed everywhere. And I'm just going to let it do that because I want more Swiss chard pretty much underneath this whole area. You know, let it compete with the weeds. Let it compete with the, uh, the comfrey. And we'll just have a comfrey weed Swiss chard mess underneath these apple trees. And um, for me, I think that's going to work. So we're going to finish off this tour, I think, in this one episode. I'm going to bring you guys all the way around from here. We're going to look at the grapes, the apples. I want to show you the pawpaw, the kiwi vines. Maybe we'll look at the gumi for a minute, the gooseberries for a minute, the plums that are a spy aid. And then we're going to go all the way around over to the raspberries, the greenhouse, look at some of that stuff we'll take you guys over to the west side of the house and then bring you guys to the front over here to the other side of the fence uh, where we have our blueberries our honeyberries and all kinds of different things so a lot of fruits that we're gonna look at in this tour so stay tuned so the first thing I want to mention here and we may have mentioned a little bit of this with the peaches in, in part one is that we bagged a lot of our fruits and I know we did a separate video on the bagging um, but the bagging is so important. That's what you see here with these, these blue and white bags. These are my apples here. They're dwarf trees. We have 20 uh, apple trees planted here. Two trees per hole, and they're spaced about 
two and a half, two feet apart from each other, maybe three feet apart. And uh, therefore, we have 20 trees in this very small space. It's a very dense planting. And we actually have uh, about 30 varieties here, even though there's 20 trees. But I've bagged all the fruits because these little guys here, what I'm holding, are some apples that I did some thinning. Just a couple rounds of thinning I like to do, where you do the first round of thinning, you come through, then the tree, maybe or maybe it is or maybe it won't, start rejecting some fruits. So you may want to wait for that to happen. And then after you do that first round and the tree starts dropping whatever it has on its own, you come in here again for a second round, and I like to do the bagging. I'll thin out the rest and then bag the other remaining fruits. And I bag all these fruits to really protect them from critters. Uh, we can also at this point assess the insect damage if we have a lot of codling moth as an example or maybe our peaches have uh, some plum cucurlio as an example. We can get rid of those fruits and then bag the rest, right? And bagging the rest is really going to keep the squirrels away, the birds away, all kinds of different um, critters that live in this backyard and come through here all the time. It's really good to protect these. I know the squirrels with the apples, they'll take the apples off the tree unripe and they'll bury them and now they'll have them there for the winter time but they'll forget about them um, I'm sure so yeah it's a good idea even some animals like to nibble on these even though they're very far from ripe they do have some decent flavor to them believe it or not um, very sour however there is some sweetness and this is a source of food so if you don't protect these apples here you're gonna kind of regret it at least if you don't have them in huge numbers and huge quantity. Another thing I like to protect is actually the grapes. The European grapes need to be protected from disease, which is why we bag them not with the organza bags. Those are mesh. This is a wax paper bag, and I know you guys can see that eh, kind of on the edge of the screen. But um, this wax paper bag, we did a separate video on that. This is protecting them from black rot. And the black rot is a bad disease here that really affects the grapes. And if I don't bag them, I pretty much have to spray uh, crazy bad chemicals and uh, at a high amount, and I really don't want to do that. So bagging them has really been the answer here. Um, and we're trying it out this time for the first year, but I know it, other, it works with other growers. And we have um, seen about an inch of rain in the last day and they held up to the, the rain no problem. I'm glad to see that they're, they're doing their thing, which is really nice. So we've also got, I don't know if you guys know this, but behind our European grape vines, because the European grapes go all the way behind or on the, the wall here on this fence, but behind these apples along the fence right in here are two muscadine grapes. And yes, I'm growing muscadine grapes here in the Philadelphia area, zone seven. And I have two varieties that will survive negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit, Lane and Triumph. And they did survive last winter, although it was quite mild. But they are back in here, and uh, they're getting established along these wires, you can see. I've also decided to plant underneath these apple rows. We have two rows, as I mentioned. And uh, I'm trying to get as much comfrey, Swiss chard, and strawberries underneath these trees. That's kind of my plan here. So we have some Swiss chard that we've had here for actually a couple of years is now going to flower and seed and we'll get those seeds and kind of scatter them all over underneath these apples. Here's my kiwi vine. It took a lot of damage with a late frost that came in and it's it's responding pretty darn well. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that. Um, it's going to get out of control pretty soon here and uh, yeah, I just hope that this thing can get into a reasonable state of maturity rather soon. But I don't even have a male. The male has died, so it's unfortunate that we have a female called Anna with no male, because even if this thing does get mature, I just will never get fruits without a male. We need that, that pollination. The Gumi is looking wonderful. It's really ripening up here, and it's got a lot of fruit. You can see how much red is in there. It's really quite insane. I love that fruit. It's become one of my favorites. We planted our one of our Sejo persimmons right here. I'm happy to see that, and I've really always uh, loved that persimmon. 
And then we have in here actually our, what is this thing? This is our gooseberry plant. And you can see actually some berries are ripening on this. And I'll pick this because we haven't done a gooseberry video just yet. They turn a little bit darker than this. I think this is Hinomaki Red, if I'm not mistaken. And it does have a red tinge to it. They are very similar, guys, to grapes. It's more of like a tart grape. And, um, you know, as a result, I think it's really nice to have in the garden or the orchard. And the reason for that is it produces an early and reliable grape that's pretty much problem free. And uh, that way you don't have to wait until October, September for the European grapes or the fall for the muscadine grapes. So this guy here, let's try it. Not perfectly ripe, but very good, very sweet. And because it's a little underripe, it's quite tart, um, but it's a good grape, man. Nice and crisp. I'm a fan, my mouth's watering now. So I wanna show you guys the uh, espaliers here of the plums because I always, I love the espaliers. I love this form. And you can see they're really getting this form. We need to tie this branch here down. And I think I may, because this branch here is loaded with fruit that it's not really growing all that much, but one of the shoots from that branch is, and this may become the main branch along this lower wire here on that tier. And then if I come over here, we've kind of kept this growth in check a little bit by doing some summer pruning. And you can even do this with your hands if you want, just pinch off the tips. And then of course on this side, we've got ourselves a similar story where we can come over here and bend one or two of these branches down to complete that form. And this really didn't take all that much time, to be honest with you. Uh, last year we put them in the ground as standard size trees and they were whips. So from a whip to a little over a year later, we pretty much have a completed espalier and uh, they're beautiful, functional, and they save a lot of space. The pawpaw, uh, these guys have finally started to grow and it's like year six now with these guys. Um, and I'm just so happy to see that they're doing something here. Now I did see, if you can believe it, I saw in a local park a stash of pawpaw trees. And I didn't even think, the park is in the city of Philadelphia. And there's many parks in Philadelphia, so I won't necessarily tell you which one, but if you know which one I'm talking about, there is a, uh, a patch, a big patch of pawpaw trees in the park. And I will be going there because my trees, as they are getting their act together now, and I expect them to flower next year, but I will go to this park in September, around September 1st, and I'll be looking hunting for pawpaws. And hopefully I could do a little bit of a video on that and show you guys uh, the patch. And uh, we also found some white and black mulberries, wild. And those are really good. And I've just been eating, I guess, a lot of fruit. I would say 70% of my diet now is of fruit. So yeah, but we got some persimmons back here. And this persimmon has always been good to me. This is proc. It's a very early persimmon highly recommend it because it is so early it does drop some fruits but overall it produces a really good crop that seems to be a lot more reliable at a younger age than other persimmons that i have so it's good at younger ages and it uh you know it does actually produce really early it produces actually i think sometime in august which is insane to have a persimmon as early as that and they're really good really good so highly recommend proc can't recommend it enough i know seijo is probably my favorite but yeah we'll show you guys more on the persimmons i really want to talk about those in this tour here but we come over here to this side of the yard and we've got things that are really ripening up believe it or not we've got more gooseberries and this is a, a green gooseberry doesn't get red it's not necessarily ripe just yet some of these may be close. I'm not going to eat any just yet. I have the net on them. And um, again, this is a really nice early grape. 
and that's why I really value them. Um, we don't have many pairs this year, and that's kind of a big disappointment. I don't know why that is, but we have one single Asian pair, and that's it. <laughs> it may have something to do with the late frost. It may have something to do with the heavy crop on them last year. I don't know. But same thing over here with the plums and the apricots and the pluots. Um, happy to see them grow. We've cut them back quite a bit. We've already done a number of summer pruning on them. As you can see, we made some cuts and they've already been setting out new shoots here. And I can even come in here as, this, as an example on this very vigorous shoot. Break that off. Oh, poor camera. Oh. <laughs> the point is here, guys, is that we, we pinched off this shoot and therefore it's going to act um, in a better way to have more fruit buds for next year. And then we also have my pride and joys right now. I've really been enjoying these fruits, I think more than most, which are my raspberries. And we've got different colored raspberries here, but the first crop is only of the reds and the pink raspberries, and they're quite numerous. Coming out here and eating more raspberries than I wanna eat um, every day. And they are just so good. I have Caroline, which is the red one, and then we have Double Gold, which is the pink ones. And again, they are really quite loaded for the first crop. And normally I don't let the first crop ripen. I cut out, cut out those floricanes and only let the primacanes come through. We also this year, um, what you can kind of see is we thinned out the primacanes, which I do every year. And that enables the tree or the bush basically to have more vigorous shoots um, and you'll have more production that way in the fall. So I do thin out the bottom of the plants basically and we take out the brown canes very soon and thin out the green ones to only six shoots per plant and that again gets us a better yield over the length of the season. Let's bring you guys over to the west side of the house. There's not really much that goes on over here, guys. Um, it's all figs, and I've updated you guys on this before, but we always have, for whatever reason, volunteer tomatoes, and it's always of, um, what is this, sun gold. We have sun gold here in the past, and these volunteer tomatoes just keep coming up every year, and they're definitely seedlings of sun gold. Um, some of them I've had in the past have been better than the original plant, some have been worse than the original plant, uh, but overall I always get myself some sun gold tomatoes because of these plants. Um, so it's pretty cool. We've got ourselves some yellow alpine or white alpine strawberries there. The figs are looking wonderful. We came out here actually today. We pinched a lot of these branches and forced, this, uh, forced these plants to fruit. As you can see, there's the sap that came out. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of these are very, very productive this year. So excited to see that. We did our current harvest yesterday. And you can see, actually, we still have black currants on these bushes. And they taste like cheese. <laughs> uh, not a big fan of them unless they're super ripe. So they got to be, you know, uh, very black, very dark and soft. Um, for me to enjoy the black currant fresh, but you know, it is enjoyable. You are supposed to process them. And then look at this red currant bush that we didn't harvest. It looks quite beautiful, doesn't it? I took the net off. We lost a lot of fruits because of the nets, but I'm making some red currant jam and I want to see how it turns out before I harvest the rest of these. But I like to come out here and eat these red currants fresh. Um, even though you're not really supposed to, and some people may not like them, they are a lot better fresh um, than the black currant. So I'll come in here and harvest an entire strand. I don't know how else to really describe this. You get a whole strand of them, put the whole thing in your mouth, and you slide the berries off with your lips. And there you go. It's a nice snack that way. 
and this way you can eat a lot of berries at once. Select one that's got a lot of, lot of red berries on it and do the same thing. It's very good. Um, we also have here, I just want to highlight a couple things. We have our jujubes over here. And I planted a number of these guys over on this side, out of their pots, into the ground. They are been flowering. They do look like they're gonna do something for me. Underneath I have shallots. Reason for the shallots is that hopefully they flower roughly around the same time that the jujube flowers because I've noticed the jujubes are putting out flowers uh, that are being pollinated by a lot of parasitic wasps. So if we can get plants that encourage parasitic wasps, we're going to have better pollination, I find, on a lot of things, particularly the jujubes, and also we're going to have less pest pressure. I really like parasitic wasps. That's a really big one. And you can see the shallots, I could have probably harvested a bunch of these by now. We have some day lilies just for some beauty. I tried to propagate one of my mulberries over here. We have a Girardi mulberry was a seedling that we originally planted and then we cleft grafted it the Girardi variety onto this but I think the uh, the entire rootstock is is dead but more to the point of the parasitic wasp we also have bronze fennel here and the bronze fennel all fennel attracts just like the alliums attracts so many parasitic wasps it's so great to have these two plants any sort of flowering allium and of course fennel goes a really long way for attracting beneficial insects we also have some seedlings here a flying dragon yes this are these are citrus they've been through an entire winter at a very small size i expect them to uh, probably leaf out put another flush of growth out once more here very soon and uh, yeah, that's kind of this whole area. Oh wait, there's one thing behind me, which is our Everest seedless grape. And this guy we got last year, and you can see there's already some black rot on it, so that's unfortunate. But I'm basically training this guy along the gutter. <laughs> and we're gonna have to trellis him up, help him out a little bit. But that's where basically he's gonna go, is along the side of the house because um, there really isn't a whole lot of room for this particular grapevine really anywhere but it is what it is isn't it so that's that's the deal got it here in the corner of the house uh it doesn't get it gets a lot of airflow believe it or not because it's very windy over here and then we have my pride and joy persimmon that i've been waiting to talk to you guys about quite some time and i'll tell you uh, it dropped a lot of fruits and it really is a shame because you guys can see here every one of these things here used to be a flower and there's so many of them if I count them all how many flowers I had um, it was probably in at least 500 flowers I mean they're all over these branches and um, you know, it's kind of just the thing that happens with these. And I know a lot of you guys ask me questions about how to stop this. I really don't know. I'll tell you one, age has a lot to do with it. And I'll also tell you now in this tree's sixth year, it seems to be holding more fruit than it did in its fifth year. <laughs> but still overall, it seems to be dropping fruits. And uh, it's a bit disheartening. Um, but there are some fruits that are holding and if I get, you know, I'll be happy with uh, 50 fruits, 75 fruits off of this, this year. Um, I would like to see obviously a lot more and as it gets bigger, a better size to it, I imagine I will. You can see some fruits there that have set. They've obviously set. It's not anything to do with the pollination issue. At least I don't believe, but they do eventually fall off for one reason or another. There are some theories out there, um, but you know, just be patient, guys. And certain varieties, I imagine, will do this less than others. Um, but again, I'm a big fan of this tree, of this fruit, 
et cetera, et cetera. It's wonderful. Um, we've also got over here, guys, um, some nectarines that are ripening. And I've bagged quite a bit of them. They're going to be ready pretty soon. I would say in the next few weeks. And we've also got a really weird one in the form of some peaches, which are my Saturn peaches. They're donut shaped, see that? It's pretty cool. Um, white peaches, white nectarines. We have the Indian blood free peach here. I'm liking and wanna do a nice little comparison for you guys of all these different peach varieties because I've got uh, probably somewhere around seven peach trees um, and one nectarine. So I want to see which one's the best, yada, yada, yada. We're here in the front. We've got our hardiness test that takes place right there of different fig varieties. We have a grafted Girardi mulberry underneath the oak tree that we just went by. So we'll have a nice little Girardi. Only gets about six by six in that area. And now we're over here to the end of the tour where we have our asparagus against the fence. Kept nice and neat or as neat as possible. And this guy has done uh, fruiting for me. At least we've stopped harvesting it. And now it turns into the fern that you see here to get some energy for next year. We've got the blueberries, the bush cherries. And the bush cherries, we have two in the front of the house over here. And uh, they just didn't really set all that much fruit for me, unfortunately. But I've even got a lot of things. There's a really a lot going on in this bed. And I've talked about in the past my chi or che um, related to the fig, related to the mulberry. And this guy, unfortunately, has always dropped its fruits. And it really is a bit of a shame. Um, however, I thought planting it in the ground might be a good idea because it'll dig itself in and have a lot more access to water. Maybe it needs a larger root system. I don't know, but uh, maybe this is the year for it. The fruits look pretty good. I've been watering it because it was a really big tree when I planted it in the ground here. So if it wasn't so big, maybe I would have said, it'll be fine. I don't have to water it. But because I planted such a large tree, um, it definitely needs more attention at first. Uh, we've also got things like honeyberries in here and the blueberries. And the blueberries I've been snacking on repeatedly. They're so, so good. I'll show you guys. We did a video on these. I'm telling you, I can come out here all day and I could be eating <laughs> blueberries. They're really insane. Um, how productive they are, how easy they are to grow for me. Um, if there's one thing that is really easy to grow in my yard, it is the blueberry. And as a result, I just eat handfuls and handfuls of these every day. This is why I'm eating 70% of my fruit, or 70% of my diet is fruit. So, so good. Now, I also have another fruit here. It's called the honeyberry. And it looks actually just like the blueberry, but has a different shape. Same color, um, similar looking plants too. The leaves have a similar shape. Um, and I'll tell you that I wasn't really sure what to think of these. But over the years I've learned that I have been sort of improperly picking them. And you really need to wait. When they turn blue, you need to wait a while. In fact, these guys have turned blue, I think even almost a month ago. And they're still on the plant. They're still not really that ripe. And I have been kind of checking on these. This one came off real easy. And that's kind of what you want, is they should really just come off nice and easy. And here's what they look like. Just to give you guys some sort of an idea. There it is. Such a weird looking fruit, huh? It looks like a blueberry, but just more elongated, I guess. 
And I'll tell you, since I've learned how to ripen these properly, they're way better. They're way better than people give them credit for. So I'm gonna try one right here. They taste better than a blueberry. In fact, it reminds me a lot of a blueberry, believe it or not, but they taste more like a wild blueberry. So I have, um, they have a more wild and interesting flavor than your typical blueberry. And they have over here, I have a variety called Chippewa, which is supposed to be a wild variety of blueberry. And this guy produces very interesting tasting blueberries. And for me, I think for my money, this is my best one. And I would really well correlate this to the honeyberry. And I actually think they're quite similar. Um, yeah. Yeah. A little bit less blueberry flavor in the honeyberry, but uh, very similar. In the past, I have compared the honeyberry to um, grapes and kiwi in one. But uh, yeah, for me, I think that's, I'm settling on that. And I'm also highly recommending that you guys grow them.